Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. And glad you're here. We keep that stool for you every Monday through Friday here on the Three Martini Lunch. Uh, we have all crazies for you today, so just be ready for that. We're also brought to you by Quip. Uh, you've heard us talk about them many times, the great electric toothbrush, uh, the pulses, and now flossing. We'll get to that when we talk about Quip in a little bit, but you need to go to getquip.com slash martini. Much more on that in just a little bit. So, Jim, let's uh, begin with our first crazy martini. And for a while, Lincoln Chafee was a Republican senator from Rhode Island. He became a Republican senator when his father passed away. He eventually lost that seat in the Democratic wave of 2006. 2010, he wins the governorship of Rhode Island as an independent. If you're a frequent listener to the Three Martini Lunch, you know he ran for president very briefly as a Democrat in 2016, made famous mostly by suggesting that America has got to switch to the metric system. Clearly the most urgent issue of our age. Now he's uh, apparently a libertarian, and he's thinking about running for president again. Boston Globe, Lincoln Chafee isn't quite ready to announce a long-shot bid for the White House as a libertarian candidate next year, but the former Rhode Island governor and U.S. senator appears to be taking steps to prepare for the race. Chafee was in Miami over the weekend for a quarterly meeting of the Libertarian National Committee, where he became a life membership-level donor and met with party activists. So Chafee says he's it's just early. He's getting to know these people. But uh, he's taking the steps to uh, perhaps be a libertarian presidential candidate. According to The Globe, there are 43 libertarian candidates who have filed paperwork to open a presidential uh, campaign account for 2020. And I know you'll be shocked, Jim, to learn that none of them have significant fundraising totals to report. So uh, what do you make of Lincoln Chafee having a very difficult time deciding what he thinks politically and where he ought to live politically? Greg, on this podcast, I would like you and me and all of our listeners, even though they're going to be hearing this a little in a little while from the moment I say these words, I want us to all be quiet for just one brief moment. So let's begin right now. Okay. That was the sound of everyone calling for Lincoln Chafee to run for president. <laughs> Couldn't hear it because no one was saying it. Lincoln Chafee, Americans are not calling your name. They may be, you know, calling out your name when they're asked who was the 16th president, but they don't mean you. <laughs> they mean the other Lincoln. Maybe your father's name will be a uh, answer to a trivia question somewhere in Trivial Pursuit somewhere or something like that. I suppose you could kind of pull the, the Charlie Crist role in which you're trying to lose a race with, as a registered member of every single party you possibly can. <laughs> um, Chris lost as an independent, lost as a, apparently at some point he lost a Republican, and they ran as a Democrat and lost. Eventually you got the House seat. Um, but I, you know, I, I could easily make a lot of jokes about Lincoln Chafee being a bad candidate by any metric <laughs> um, and, and other jokes. But just observe something. It, it's really kind of fascinating when you see these people who appear to be out of the game and they're not there. People are not clamoring for them to come back into the game. There's not a, Hey, you know, who was really awesome. And I wish we'd run again. I wish like, and you could probably apply this to when George Pataki ran for president. Newsflash listeners, George Pataki ran for president in 2016. I know you probably forgot about him. Jim Gilmore, fine enough governor. I met him in TV green rooms. a perfectly nice enough guy, but no, the people were not clamoring for Jim Gilmore to run for president. Uh, people were not clamoring for Lincoln Chafee to run for president as a Democrat back in 2016 either. You really look at these people and you kind of wonder, is it, it, you know, is it like the old guy who, who buy, still has a fast car and feels the need to drive really fast? Or, you know, these, these sense of the retirees who don't know what to do with their lives. You know, I, I kind of wonder for some of these people, you, you, you've been an elected official. People have been hanging on your every word. People, you, you have the ability to veto legislation, sign legislation into law make things happen, issue vetoes, uh, state contracts, you, know, you, you have power, and then you lose it. And that probably hurts. That, that probably, there, there is probably a, a snap back to reality. And all of a sudden, I, I would say your wife's telling you to take out the garbage, but Lincoln Chafee's a pretty wealthy guy. He may have servants, I don't know. But the point is that like, all of a sudden, you're not the center of attention anymore. You have to live a life as an ordinary citizen, the way most of us do. Most of us don't have anybody hanging on her everywhere. We don't have yes men. If you write for a living, you have a lot of no men. 
you have a lot of people telling you, no, that's not good. You can't run that. Or no, go back and edit this. And then you put it out on Twitter. People tell you you're an idiot. You know, th- there's this, th- there's something a little bit sad about this. And I, and I, you know, as much as I could make fun of Lincoln JB, I really want him to like to go off and have a happy rest of his life. And I don't think he needs to run for president. And there's something a little bit sad about watching these people who have had decent careers in politics, unable to pass the torch to somebody else, unable to say, you know what? Um, I've had my moment in the sun. It's time to let a younger generation take over. They just can't do it. And it's, it's kind of a little bit sad. So as much as I enjoy making fun of this guy, I really hope there's somebody around Lincoln Chafee, somebody, some close friend, maybe his spouse, maybe family member, somebody who could say, you know, Link, it's, it's just not happening. It, it just this, I know you want it to happen. I know you want to get back in the game. I know this gets the, the blood pumping and all that stuff, but um, it's not good for you. It's not good for the country. It, you know, you, you want to write a book or something, fine. You want to teach, fine. There's got to be some way where you can feel like you're giving back to your country in a better way than running once again to try to run the place because that, that no one is really clamoring for you to be in the Oval Office, Lincoln J.B. So if he does this, I assume then it's uh, Link Chafee Green Party 2024. I mean, where else does he have to go after this? Right. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, he, he could always try to run as an actual, you know, conservative Republican. <laughs> well, that's never the, tried that. That's the other question I've got here because you know when you think of libertarian in, in recent times, the name Ron Paul obviously uh, comes to mind pretty quickly. Uh, government needs to be much smaller. Get the government out of regulation and taxes and and shrink, shrink, shrink the government. That's uh, just get it out of our lives as much as possible. And now, and, and Gary Johnson to to a large extent was along those same lines. He wanted a smaller government. He was very fiscally conservative as the governor of New Mexico. But then he adds Bill Weld to the ticket uh, in, in 2016. Obviously, they didn't go anywhere, but he was a more liberal governor of Massachusetts. Chafee was the guy that we pretty much counted on to side with the Democrats when he was in the Senate. So why are the liberal Republicans somehow attracted to the Libertarian Party? I'm trying to imagine Ron Paul or Justin Amash hanging out yeah. with Lincoln Chafee and going, yeah, man, totally right with you the whole way. Yeah, there's this idea of, you know, there, it's like, there are a certain number of people in this world who are Republican. Like, it is, there is a rumor that Lincoln Chafee stayed a Republican while he was in office because of a promise to his father. His father was a, a old New England, you know, probably somewhat liberal Republican, but, you know, back at a time when the ideological divide amongst the parties was not as bad. Um, Lincoln Chafee, back when he was in the Senate, boy, you know, you'd see a New York Times headline saying, you know, uh, Senate Republicans object to Bush initiative. And the quote would be from Lincoln Chafee, right. who objected to every Bush administration initiative. You're like, well, and then you jump to the fold on page A24 of the New York Times. And then you'd see two quotes from Olympia Snow and Susan Collins saying they had concerns, but they hadn't <laughs> yet turned against it. And then the rest of the column would be the rest of the Republicans and Republicans are perfectly fine with this. You'd be like, wait a second. This article does not say what the New York Times headline does, but it's all because of Lincoln Chafee. And Lincoln Chafee would co-sponsor every major piece of Democratic legislation that came down the pike. And they'd say, see, this is bipartisan. And if this was during the time period when uh, Joe Lieberman was an independent, it would be tripartisan. There were three parties and, and Joe Lieberman totally wasn't a Democrat anymore. There's this idea that, you know, oh, I'm a Republican, but I'm not that conservative. Ergo, I'm a libertarian. Eh, not really. And let me point out that I've always kind of suspected, Greg, that for a certain number of libertarians, not all, certainly not those who are likely to vote for the party, but there's a certain person out there who says, I'm a libertarian. And what they mean is, I'm a fairly conservative Republican, but I don't want you to argue with me about it. If you live in a blue state, you're probably more likely to say, am I a Republican? No, no, no. I'm one of those cool libertarians, man. Lower my taxes. Well, I guess they've got a big tent over there. There's just not very many people in it, but there's lots of different corners you can oh, get into. The libertarian tent is the one that had the guy dancing in his Speedos at the <laughs> convention last time, at the 2016. This was, you know, Republicans nominate Trump. A lot of folks aren't happy with him. Democrats nominating Hillary Clinton. There was The stage was set for libertarians. You click on C-SPAN, you're watching the convention. It's a fat guy dancing in a Speedo. And lots of Americans said, nope, click. <laughs> Can you tell I've just had I've been burned by hopes? Oh, maybe the Libertarians will have a good candidate this year. Just one time too many. Going back to Harry Brown. Oh, wow. Yeah, I remember Harry Brown. Wow. Well, the Libertarians, if they do want to get competitive, need to clean some things up. And if uh, you need to clean some things up like your teeth and your gums, Quip's the way to go. Well, we've talked about Quip many times. Uh, they make the, the Quip electric toothbrush and one of the things that they're really focused on now is creating great dental habits and there's nothing better to help establish those habits than the Quip electric toothbrushes. We've talked about the the pulses, which tell you when to shift to, to different parts of your mouth. So 
even when your brain is still not functioning in the morning, you can do that. Uh, they make it possible to travel with it. They give you the mount on your mirror so you can't miss it in the morning, and it's just fantastic. But when it comes to habits, you got to set them and, and keep them going every day, and that means brushing for two minutes twice a day and flossing regularly no matter what brand you use. But Quip makes it simple, starting with an electric toothbrush, refillable floss, and anti-cavity toothpaste. Quip's electric brush has sensitive sonic vibrations with a built-in timer and 30-second pulses to guide a full and even clean. The Quip floss dispenser comes with pre-marked string to help you use just enough. Plus, Quip delivers fresh brush heads, floss, and toothpaste refills to your door every three months with free shipping, so your routine is always just right. Join more than 3 million healthy mouths and get Quip today, starting at $25. You can't beat that. And as we've mentioned, uh, we use Quip. Um, my kids just got Quip not that long ago. Once uh, we talked about it on the ad here, my wife said, hey, kids Quip, let's do that. Kids love it. Uh, brushing teeth in the morning and in the evening, uh, they have uh, much more excitement for it uh, than they did before. If you go to getquip.com slash martini right now, you'll get your first refill pack free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash martini. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash martini. Quip, the good habits company. All right, Jim, we've got a debate tomorrow for the Democrats and uh, their never-ending uh, primary season. And then there's another debate on December 19th, which I'm sure will be the biggest ratings of all because nobody has anything going on on December 19th. But Politico and PBS are uh, teaming up for this one. And so whenever that happens, you get uh, a combination of folks asking the questions. Uh, we've seen that. Uh, I think the NBC and the New York Times, maybe CNN and the New York Times did that at one of the debates. And so Politico's trying to figure out who to send. And their publisher, Robert Albritton, wants to send Tim Alberta. He's the chief political correspondent for Politico magazine, recently wrote a book about how Trump has uh, pretty much taken over the Republican Party. And, Jim, you wrote about this today. You you remind everyone that he did work for National Review for over a year, and that is becoming a huge problem for the Democrats because they don't want anyone with even a whiff of uh, conservatism on them to be part of this. Uh, NBC News with the quote, Democratic Party officials say such a journalist is ill-suited to co-moderate a debate meant to better inform Democratic voters about their potential nominees. And, Jim, I remember 2016, uh, some of the media outfits uh, brought in conservatives to ask a couple of questions. Hugh Hewitt at CNN, Mary Catherine Hamm for ABC, and everybody else was a liberal. I mean, they worked for the media outlets, but you could tell by the way they asked the questions uh, where they were coming from. And for the Democrats, it's not enough to just not let Fox host something. We can't let anybody who has ever had any affiliation with conservatives to be part of this. Yeah. Look, first of all, if Republicans can get questions from George Stephanopoulos, you guys can handle a question from Tim Alberta. But actually, that, that comparison doesn't do Tim Alberta justice. Um, and I recognize that the more I argue Tim Alberta is a trusted guy, uh, <laughs> as a writer for National Review, the more Democrats are going to say, see, we can't trust him. Jim thinks he's OK. We all know what a crazed right wing maniac Jim is. Um, Tim Alberta, he was my colleague for about a year. So I think, you know, probably hung out the most at the GOP convention uh, in 2016. Um, he was with us for about a year and maybe a couple of months after that. It was it was, you know, it's not like this is a long time venerated guy. And I tell people, if you have any doubts about Tim Alberta, go back into our archives. I put a link in the, in the corner post the other day. Tim Alberta was here to be a reporter. He was a, he was our, I believe his title was our national political correspondent, which by the way, is different from my title as senior political correspondent. The difference is that he covered national politics and I was old. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the difference between a national political correspondent and a senior political correspondent. Tim Alberta wrote articles. He wrote interview. He did interviews. He did profiles. He was not an opinion columnist. His job was not to say uh, Republicans are awesome, Democrats are terrible, rah, 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 anything like that. Moved on to Politico. I'm hoping they paid him a lot because I hated to see him go. Uh, followed our form, my, one of my former colleagues, uh, Eliana Johnson, over there. And what uh, Tim does is he goes out and he writes really good, in-depth, well-reported articles, sometimes profiles of figures. But a lot of what he's done for the last couple of years has been kind of the beat of how the Republican Party transformed. And if you read his book, The American Carnage, came out just this summer, you say, I think you can kind of tell where Tim Alberta comes down. 
Tim Alberta is not a uh, fan of the president, although he did interview the president, and he is not necessarily a fan of the Republican establishment either. He sees a lot of blame and a lot of bad behavior and a lot of things that he doesn't like all around there. Does this mean Tim's a Democrat? No, I have no idea how he voted. I have no idea if he voted in the Republican primary. I have no idea who he supported. I would say judge the man by his work. And let's observe. You know, one of the other people on this stage is going to be Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow, who was talking about, you know, ooh, we've got Trump's tax returns. And it was like four pages from, you know, lots of years ago and all that kind of stuff. I mean, if you, I don't quite understand what makes Tim Alberta so utterly unacceptable to ask a question that we all know a bunch of candidates are going to dodge anyway. Um, the, the idea that, oh, he's got conservative cooties. We can't let that on his on there. I think it is really, the idea and see has made a whole bunch of mistakes with these debates. The, the, um, the fact that Tom Steyer is up there and, uh, not, you know, much, some much more uh, credible, much more, some candidates who aren't billionaires up there doesn't reflect well on them. The fact that we're getting close to crunch time and we still have 10 candidates up on stage and they haven't divided up into smaller groups, that doesn't reflect well with the DNC. But now we're at the point where they, you know, look, this, they look scared. They sound scared. Basically, they see their candidates as a bunch of Fabergé eggs. They are going to crumble if you press them with a question that they might not like. Guess what, folks? You're running to be president of the United States. Every president is going to have to deal with some unexpected surprise, some unexpected world event that they have to deal with, right? Taking tough questions from people you don't necessarily agree with is part of the job. Trump's got a whole bunch of flaws, but you know what he does? It takes a lot of questions from a lot of reporters he doesn't like every, all, you know, almost every day. You may not like the answers, but he stands there and he takes it. But no, 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 no. Democratic candidates, they can't take it. Oh, protect them, protect them. Wrap them in bubble wrap. You know, it's just so infuriating that they, you know, that they would even try to pull this kind of stuff. If you can't handle Tim Alberta, you are not ready to be president of the United States. Full stop, total period. Rah. <laughs> That's exactly right. And the idea that, you know, if you put folks that might have some sort of uh, inclination towards the right asking questions, it's going to just be a partisan festival for them. Go back to the first Republican debate in 2016. Every one of those endless numbers of Republicans on the stage, the first question they got asked was about their greatest vulnerability. That's why Megyn Kelly was asking Trump about women. And I mean, if CNN and MSNBC and everybody else was doing that to the Democrats, it really wouldn't matter who was asking the questions. But because they're just propping them up there, uh, it makes for less exciting television and makes it harder for voters to come to a conclusion. In a better world. You'd have all three networks doing de- all three cable networks and, and major, major networks too doing debates. And you'd be getting questions from all sides of the ideological spectrum. I actually think it would be good. Like it, when, as much as, you know, we could argue about George Stephanopoulos is out of the blue. So when are you going to ban birth control? Uh, question <laughs> from way back when. But you know what? Look, it's not like a Republican president is never going to have to deal with challenges from the left. So it'd be good to see how do you deal with questions from the left, right? I, would, I wouldn't necessarily mind left of center. You know, if you, if you want to bring in, I mean, as long as the question is a genuine question and not just, you know, two minutes of berating you and or, so which opposition research point are you least prepared to deal with? <laughs> uh, you know, those kind of questions I could see. Object. That's not going to be Tim Alberta. My guess is Tim Alberta's questions, if, if given the opportunity, would be something uh, that will represent extensive research. He's a guy who did like, I think he interviewed like, you know, he's a 600 page book, American Carnage. I think he interviewed like 500 people in Republican circles to, t- to tell the story of how Trump effectively took over the, the Republican Party. Now you can love it, his book, you can hate his book, but uh, you cannot say that Alberta does not do his homework on this. And that's how you get good questions instead of, you know, the Barbara Wawa, you know, if you were a twee, what kind of twee would you be? <laughs> All right. Well, to make a decision like this for petty political reasons uh, suggests you might be on something. So let's talk about our crazy martini now because it ties in perfectly. Uh, As we all know, there is uh, drug addiction problems all over the country. We've talked about the opioid opioid crisis a number of times. President Trump certainly campaigned on that a lot in 2016 and has taken some steps on that uh, since becoming president. Uh, but it's uh, it's also the issue of meth and the upper Midwest uh, and uh, the Plain States are a big area where that's a problem. I come from northern Michigan, and there are certainly stories in the local news uh, on that issue from time to time. South Dakota has decided to uh, call attention to this issue, and I can say that they've definitely called attention to it. But uh, they've got this new campaign slogan that simply says, meth. I'm on it, which, of course, the purpose is saying 
I'm going to help do my part and help South Dakota not have a problem with meth anymore. But, of course, when you first read that, it's a, it's a bunch of pictures. One's a rancher. Another one's a bunch of high school football players with the giant letters all in caps, meth, I'm on it, or meth, we're on it. And obviously it, it looks like almost a, a pro-meth campaign. But uh, the, the governor there, Christy Nome, who used to be in Congress, says the whole point was to raise awareness. Jim, I think they've raised some awareness. Whether it's gotten the right awareness, I'm not sure. You know, I go back and forth on this because if they had gone with a less, oh, my God, how did they pick that one type, you know, you know, addiction destroys lives or something like that. Greg, would you and I be talking about it? Nope. Probably not. Right. And would people be talking about it on social media? Probably not. My guess is that, you know, there, there are, we've seen a lot of these sorts of efforts from a lot of different government agencies and nonprofits. And they, they you know. We, if we hear about them, if they get covered at all, we kind of nod and say, oh, that's nice. And then we kind of move on with about our lives. Saying meth, I'm on it. Uh, everyone's like, oh, my goodness, can you believe? It sounds like they're on meth, as if this has never quite crossed their mind. My suspicion is they know darn well that people are going to react like that and then instantly say, oh, my God, I go on Facebook and share everybody, this to everybody. And here's the other thing. The fact that they're saying, you know, you see the picture of the farmer, you see the picture of the high school football players, you know, the... Uh, the elderly elderly woman, and they say, I'm on meth, right? It's communicating a message. It's communicating a message that people who you don't think of as being on meth can get addicted to meth, can get access to meth, can end up uh, uh, with addiction that ends up destroying their lives, at the very least, you know, uh, harming it a great deal. And, And so maybe they know what they're doing with this. Maybe this is actually a way to get a heck of a lot more attention to it. And maybe the recognition this comes to shake us out of complacency, to shake us out of an idea of, well, yeah, yeah, it happens, but, you know, generally my community is doing okay. There's a very good chance your community isn't doing okay, at least not 100%, and that there's probably somebody in your community who's either, if not struggling with this addiction, then struggling with some sort of addiction somewhere. So I actually this may not be quite as foolish as it sounds. That having been said, I think I'm a, a, the, the, the craziness of the martini is that the regular message of addiction destroys lives could not break through in this environment, it would be largely ignored right. in this environment. And you need to do something that makes it sound like state administrators are on meth to get people to sit up and take notice. Yes. And the website to learn more is onmeth.com. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not I typing this in am on meth right now.com. Provocative, but it works. It's uh, well, we'll see if it works, but uh, it's definitely gotten the attention. And uh, if raising awareness is step one, well, I think they've accomplished that. We'll see if it actually helps to lead to more discussions and more treatments and uh, fewer people really on math. So, yeah, this, is, this is the most controversial name of a new government program since I believe it was a nonprofit that wanted to form shortly after 9 11. It's going to call itself the Foundation of United Citizens for the Killing of International Terrorists. Jim, on that note, as we try to stay PG, we will uh, <laughs> disengage for today. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Definitely glad you were here and on the stool with us today. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to the podcast and uh, please leave us a great review. Also, don't forget about our wonderful sponsors at Quip. You need to go to getquip.com slash martini and tune in again Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.